Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning if you're on the West Coast, and welcome to today's NeTech COVID-19 webinar session. Uh, today, we're going to talk about tackling the COVID-19 storm through the lens of the long-term care facility. So I'll be your host today. I'm Ted Cieslak. I'm a pediatrician and infectious disease physician by training, uh, currently serving as the executive director for health security at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And being a pediatrician, I am very far removed from the expertise needed to intelligently talk about today's topic. So uh, after this welcome is over and some housekeeping remarks, I'll turn it over to the uh, real experts. And we have two sets of experts today. First, from the Washington State Public uh, Health uh, Entity, uh, we have Sarah Podrzebinski and Patty Montgomery. Um, and they'll talk about their experience out in the state of Washington, which as you can imagine is extensive. Uh, and then they'll turn it over to some of our local folks here uh, in Omaha, Nebraska with the House of Hope uh, Alzheimer's Care Center. Uh, after that, uh, I'll give some more housekeeping remarks and then time permitting, uh, we'll deal with your questions and answers. Let me say a little bit about questions and answers right now. Uh, you'll notice at the bottom of your screen, there is a question and answer button, uh, and that's what you should use to pose questions. Don't use the chat function, instead use the question and answer button. So again, we're sponsored by NETEC, and NETEC is the National Emerging Special Pathogens Training and Education Center, again, funded by generous grants from the Assistant Secretary of Preparedness and Response and the Centers for Disease Control. And our mission at NETEC is to increase the capability of our federal public health and healthcare systems to safely and effectively manage individuals with suspected and confirmed special pathogens. And we started out working with Ebola and we've transitioned into working with COVID, uh, which I'm sure all of you uh, are also busily consumed with. So at NETEC, we offer a whole host of assistance to you. Uh, we provide assessment capability. Uh, we can empower you to do self-assessment. We can provide uh, metrics for your own use. And uh, often we will send a team to do on-site assessment. We also uh, provide a lot of educational offerings, uh, both through online trainings as well as in-person courses. And finally, uh, through webinars as you're participating in today. Uh, we offer a wide range of technical assistance, including on-site and remote guidance. We have uh, an online repository of tools and resources. Uh, we have a whole set of exercise templates that you can use, uh, and we also have an emergency on-call number. And then finally, we support a robust research network with an online repository of research protocols, uh, as well as policies and procedures, and we're creating the infrastructure to develop a specimen bio repository. With all of that said, let me turn it over to the real experts. So uh, Sarah and Patty, it's all yours. Great, thank you, Dr. C. Slack. All right, so uh, I'm Sarah Podrovinsky, and I'm here with my, um, my colleague, Patty Montgomery. We are both infection preventionists, and we work at the Washington State Department of Health, and we're thrilled to be talking to you all today to share our experience um, with COVID-19 specifically as it relates to long-term care facilities. Uh, and we are joined by our, our partners at Public Health Seattle and King County, Claire Grostrom smith who is the Healthcare Associated Infections Program Manager there, and Dr. James Lewis, who um, has been a key leader in the COVID response with long-term care facilities. And um, before I get into the slides, I also want to thank NETEC for this opportunity. I've always looked to NETEC for resources with regard to Ebola and now other emerging pathogens. And, and I'm, I'm happy that um, this, web, this webinar series is happening and, and know that it's going to put out a lot of great education to folks out there. Washington State, uh, as most of you are aware, um, we were a state of first with regard to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and, you know, there's a couple of dates that really stick out in my head, and I'll never forget, right? So, a, a January 20th um, came into work, and that's when we, we learned that the first case of COVID-19 in the U.S. was identified in a Snohomish County resident here in Washington State, um, and that person had recent travel to Wuhan, China. Um, and then, 
you know, if you're just, I know we've all been working so diligently on COVID and it's the, the time seems to be moving um, in ways that it never has before. But if I think back to January and February, it seems like a totally different world. And back then, um, COVID testing was really just starting to be performed locally. And at the time, we were really focused on travel screening. And the criteria for testing persons for COVID was incredibly limited and, and was really limited to those that had traveled to affected areas in the world. And at the time, our understanding of COVID was very different than it is now. So at the time, what we knew is that COVID-19 could be circulating in our community as we had identified the first case in January. So we knew it could be circulating, but we didn't have a good understanding of, of what the burden was or the impact. Um, we also knew that nursing homes were in smack in the middle of a really hard influenza and respiratory virus season. And that's what we were really focused on with nursing homes at the time, not so much with COVID. And, um, you know, I know Patty here in the office with me and Claire at King County, even up until right before we identified this, the, the first outbreak in the nursing home in Washington State, they were out there doing flu education with nursing homes. And I really want to applaud them for doing that because that was really important, especially at the beginning of this, even before we knew about COVID. Um, what we also knew is that we were having PPE shortages in nursing homes, managing just to manage flu outbreaks, you know, not even thinking about COVID. All right, so, so just to kind of um, give you a sense of the timeline, in late February, we received a call from our local public health partners at Public Health Seattle and King County. And um, for those of you that are, just to give you a sense of, of where that is located, King County is in Western Washington, and it's the most populated county in Washington state. Now, our local public health colleagues told us about an outbreak of a respiratory illness in a nursing home. And as I mentioned earlier, we're right in the middle of flu season, so that really did complicate things and made it a little bit more challenging to identify this as COVID. Uh, the, the nursing home was proactive, they had tested for flu, everything was negative. Um, but the clinical timeline of that, the first case that was reported to us is really important because it really gives you a sense of just how insidious this infection truly is, especially with regard to, um, uh, to nursing home residents who are incredibly vulnerable. And on February 19th, a nursing home resident developed respiratory illness and that patient had deteriorating respiratory symptoms. So five days later, February 24th, the resident was admitted to the hospital and intubated the very next day. At the hospital, everything was negative with regard to bacterial and viral testing. And the hospital had a few patients with acute respiratory symptoms of unknown etiology. So outreach was done to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or the CDC, who granted permission to test the nursing home patient and one other, out, one other outside of that CDC guidance that I mentioned at the start. Um, and both were found to be positive for COVID. So this was on February 28th. This is another date that I will remember. Um, sadly, that, that first patient at that nursing home that I have been talking about died on March 2nd. Um, so again, symptoms started about February 19th and that patient died March 2nd. So that was a very, very fast decline. Now, what you're looking at on the slide right now is an article that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. I encourage you all to read it if you haven't, um, but it describes um, the outbreak that Patty and I are going to be talking to you about. And for the purpose of this presentation, Patty and I are going to refer to the nursing home where that first outbreak was identified as Facility A. And, um, for your awareness, Facility A is a skilled nursing facility. There's 130 residents total there and 170 staff. Okay, so um, uh, I wanted to start out um, just uh, with this, art uh, this article that was in the New England Journal of Medicine by Rachel Werner, um, Long-Term Care Policy After COVID-19. And this really struck me, uh, the bolded text. Well, it's all bolded here, but the, the last sentence, um, they were like tinderboxes, ready to go up in flames with just a spark. The tragedy unfolding in nursing homes is the result of decades of long-term 
care policy, neglect of long-term care policy. And, you know, when this um, was published, it was a couple months after our outbreak, but in February, uh, we did not think that things were this bad. In fact, um, we felt like things were pretty good in our nursing homes in Washington. And honestly, we had been doing all that flu education, so we're really feeling like nursing homes were poised to identify cases of COVID because they were doing surveillance for respiratory infections already. So on February 28th, things were uh, moved very quickly. Um, the cases of, at the nursing home were identified as COVID-19 on that Friday night. It was a Friday, of course. And CDC arrived in Seattle on Saturday, and on Sunday we were in the facility to investigate. So um, we knew this facility, and this facility was a high-performing facility with regard to infection prevention and had been proactive. They had worked with us um, with both state and local partners. They were always participating in any education we offered. I had been in the building, um, King, uh, Public Health Seattle, King County had been to visit. They were very welcoming um, to our, our input and interventions, and were really hoping to do a good job, and they were rated very highly on, um, I think they had a four-star or five-star, I don't know what the highest star rating is on the um, Nursing Home Compare website, but they had that. But of course, like most nursing homes, they had challenges. Um, the facility did have an infection preventionist, with a, which was a strength, and she was trained. Um, but she was doing many, many, many jobs. She was the employee health person. She was doing the med cart during the week. She was covering on weekends. Um, she was doing restorative care. Um, and this is something that uh, we find a lot when we go to nursing homes. So she really didn't have a lot of time dedicated to doing infection prevention. Um, and she didn't have a lot of time to put competency-based training uh, really into place or um, to be doing auditing regularly, which just takes a lot of time. You, it, infection prevention in a nursing home is a full-time job. So when we got to the nursing home, uh, what we found were um, all frightened family members outside the building, and probably many of you saw this on the news, and they were really freaked out. And this was the first nursing home, so they just closed the doors. They were uh, terrified, and um, so the family members were confused and frightened. Um, there was media at the gates and um, they were filming um, constantly. And then um, the residents and the staff, there were many of them coughing and sick. The building was very short staffed. Many caregivers um, had come from other buildings, so their own staff was out sick and others came in to cover for them. Um, they didn't have uh, a, a lot of PPE and they didn't have eye protection at all. Uh, they hardly had any hand sanitizer. Um, you know, it wasn't spread out in the units like they, it is now. It was, you know, um, it, they had hand sanitizer, but it was sporadic in the, in the units. They had multiple different types of, of masks um, being worn, and some people weren't wearing them um, at all. Uh, uh, they had a few private rooms. They have few private rooms. They had some three bedrooms, and many residents were uh, symptomatic. They had um, emergency medical service persons exposed. So what we did was we implemented um, competency-based training, but only after we assessed the residents um, for need to transfer to a higher level of care. And my colleague James Lewis um, did that. Uh, so, so physicians from King County came up to assess the residents at, um, at the nursing home. And we set up screening for employees and visitors. So those screening stations that everybody has now, we set up the first one. We facilitated testing for all the residents and we facilitated testing for the staff. And uh, King County was a big part of that. Um, the, the hospital and the community did a drive-through testing, but King County Public Health went out and, um, and did testing of folks who couldn't leave their homes. Um, but there were a total of 167 cases of COVID linked to facility. Um, 101 residents. Um, so if you recall, there's a total of 130 residents, and uh, a total of uh, there's a total of 130 residents at that facility. Um, so that means that 77% of the the residents were positive. 50 healthcare personnel, or 39%, and uh, 16 visitors. Um, so this was, of course, before visitor restrictions went into place. Unfortunately, one visitor did pass away um, due to COVID. 
In terms of case fatality rate, um, it was 33.7 for residents. To give you some context, in Washington State, um, in the general population, when they look at the number of cases of COVID and look at how many of these cases did pass away, it's 3.3% total in Washington. So compare that uh, to 33.7% in this particular outbreak, so quite high. So this slide shows an epi curve and it shows uh, those initial tests that were done. And you can see that we didn't do testing all in one day. Um, and if you guys can remember back, there were some barriers to getting testing done then. Um, we didn't have, <laughs> we, had, uh, we had limited people trained to actually collect nasal pharyngeal swabs. And we had to collect both nasal pharyngeal swabs and oral pharyngeal swabs. And we had just started doing testing at our public health lab. So um, the, the big spike there, the 41 uh, folks were tested on a day that Health and Human Services came on March 9th, which was a Saturday. And they came to relieve the staff that had been working and they tested the majority of the residents in the facility. Um, so this next slide you should be looking at, um, this came out of that New England Journal of Medicine article that we've been talking about. And this really highlights the fact that there, there's a lot of um, mobility between different nursing homes and healthcare facilities, and that healthcare workers, especially those in nursing homes, work more than one job, right? So you can see here there's a total of nine facilities that were ultimately linked, um, either having shared healthcare workers or patients being transferred and resulting in transmission. Um, so this was one of our key takeaways uh, with this particular outbreak, and we have seen this as a theme across our state and are, are, are working to provide some education on the importance of having strong communication when transferring residents um, between healthcare facilities and, and really, you know, having good screening practices with healthcare workers and trying to, to better understand um, which healthcare workers are working multiple jobs. Um, just for risk awareness. So what our findings were, um, were that staff were plus symptomatic, uh, staff worked in more than one facility, um, staff had in, inadequate familiar, familiarity with and adherence to um, uh, personal protective equipment recommendations, there were challenges in implementing proper infection control practices, inadequate supplies of PPE and hand sanitizer, um, there was delayed recognition of cases and limit availab limited availability of testing and difficulty identifying persons with COVID-19 based on signs and symptoms. Now, that was back in March, but we're still having some of those gaps today. Um, asymptomatic transmission is something that we're really um, seeing as, a, as an issue, and um, we're learning more about it and trying to understand the role in transmission in congregate settings like nursing homes. Um, and then with symptoms, we keep adding symptoms. So the only symptoms we were looking for back in uh, February, March were fever and cough, and now there are several symptoms that have been added. Um, so this is as we've been learning, um, but we haven't really addressed um, the barrier with inadequate supplies of PPE and hand sanitizer. They're still very difficult to, to get. Um, there are challenges with fit testing for N95s in long-term care. This is an unusual and when this is done, the fit tested respirators are often not available to nursing homes. There are inadequate supplies of hand sanitizer still, and um, there's still delayed recognition of cases um, because of the asymptomatic transmission and limited testing supplies. Um, so we're, you know, with, which requires facilities to focus on the symptomatic residents. And in terms of staff working in multiple facilities, this was a key learning personally for me. I didn't realize how many nursing home employees work at more than one facility. I didn't realize how many were not insured. And I, I didn't realize, um, you know, those are economic factors and that they need to be um, addressed at, at some point. But facilities cannot um, ask staff to commit to one facility. They, they can't enforce it. They can request it, but they can't enforce that um, because, you, you know, people are free to do uh, what they need to do. So um, it will still happen that uh, for economic reasons, staff will come to work um, symptomatic because they may not have sick time and need the money. Um, we had really good collaboration with the facility 
and with the hospital. We have great partners here in Washington State. Um, the state and the county and the federal teams all worked really well together. We all knew each other. Um, we had an ICAR program that we worked on um, for a couple of years before this happened. So there was a lot of trust and understanding of our different roles and responsibilities. I have to say um, that the dedication and the courage of the staff really stands out to me. They were wonderful to work with. Um, and, you know, what was happening around us was a, was a disaster, but what was happening around uh, the staff was really so much more than that. Um, relationships between the staff and residents at nursing homes and long-term care can be really close. People develop affection for each other, and people were dying, and there was no opportunity for grief. Um, yet all these people kept coming to work volunteering to work um, uh, when, uh, because they knew how short their colleagues were and they wanted to take care of their residents. Um, and the other thing that went well, we were eventually able to test everyone, which really helped us gain a better understanding and how to cohort patients and residents. All right, so, you know, certainly there are things that we would like to, that would have been helpful to, um, to have in place or have been prepared for before all this happened, including, you know, Patty's already talked about the media attention, and you all have seen the reports of um, staff having to hold sheets um, to protect the privacy of residents being moved into the ambulances and being transferred out. Um, but that was just overwhelming, and, and for staff to have to manage that and come to work every day, um, it, you know, having some sort of a plan or, or a way to better manage that would would be incredibly useful. Um, more TPE, um, you know, this is, we've talked about this plenty of times. I don't think I need to harp on this much more, but um, this continues to be a struggle. Um, you know, I, I've said this on, on other presentations, but, you know, Patty's gone into nursing homes where they there's, there's a lot, so much of the lack of PPE that staff are ordering swim goggles off of um, online websites and are wearing garbage bags for, for gowns. So it's truly a dire situation. And, and ha having, um, having more plans um, that incorporate nursing homes with regard to PPE stockpile is, is really imperative. Uh, nursing home regulations. So at the time, you know, we were in the process of really incorporating infection prevention basics like promoting the use of hand sanitizer and having disinfectant wipes available to clean equipment. But as, as many of you probably know, these facilities are really home-like environments. So putting some of these infection control processes in place comes with its uh, own unique challenges, and these are things that we need to continue working on. Uh, and then lastly, and we developed, you know, had we really had a better awareness of other at-risk settings for elders, and, and when I say this, I'm, for our experience, I'm talking specifically about adult family homes. And so in Washington, most of the long-term care facilities in our state are adult family homes, and these homes typically have anywhere from two to six residents, and I think Patty's going to talk a little bit about that next as we wrap up the presentation, um, but we had not here at the State Department of Health really done infection prevention assessments in these adult family homes, and we learned that that was something that was essential. Um, so on this slide, um, you can see the continuum of settings in Washington, and it's probably like this in your in your um, in your states as well. And we had really only been working with assisted living and skilled nursing facilities um, before uh, COVID, and now we're working with all all five setting types. And so um, uh, that has been new for us. All right. So this, this every week we we publish. Um, statewide numbers that, that show long-term care associated cases, and I've already talked a little bit about the impact in our state. 60% um, of the deaths in Washington state uh, are likely long-term care associated. So that means that, you know, either a staff member, visitor, or resident um, was impacted. Um, so but 60% of the deaths, and that's a very, very high number and concerning. But as what you're looking at right now on the screen is our, our EPI curve looking at the long-term care associated cases by illness onset. These are data current as of 
uh, July 6th, and you can see where the peak was really towards late March, early April, and it, it has dropped off. And Patty did a nice overlay on this slide that shows you where some of the infection control um, um, orders and processes were put into place March 16th with visitor restrictions, universal masking on April 7th, and now um, the latest edition is universal eye protection on July 9th. So what we're doing now um, going forward is we're trying to mitigate the risks in long-term care. Um, we're just starting our point prevalence testing in adult family homes and assisted living um, centers. Uh, we have completed our point prevalence uh, work with skilled nursing facilities and assisted livings with memory care units, and I think we're expecting a report um, in the next day or so. Um, in addition, we've been providing infection control assessments virtually, and we've been doing them by telephone. Um, for the adult family homes, uh, the visits have been primarily virtual, and with the nursing homes and assisted livings, we're on site about half the time. Um, we have prioritized uh, facility assessments for when um, uh, facilities have cases so that we, we go into the facility so that we can help them, um, you know, reassure them and help them um, make decisions about cohorting. And I think um, one of the good things is, is we do this with our partners at the local health jurisdiction. So while we're out in these facilities, we're building relationships and trust. All right, this is our, our last slide. So, um, you know, we've reviewed a lot and just what we're learning and, and we're hopeful that we can take some next steps that will really carry us down the road and, and, and think long-term in terms of reform and regulation in, in nursing homes and other long-term care facilities. But we've, we've learned there really needs to be higher standards for infection control programs, better staff to resident ratios, um, it, it, taking care of um, you know, over eight to ten residents for for one certified nursing assistant is it's a lot, and and that's some of the hardest work I, I've worked in nursing homes, and that's some of the hardest work I've ever done. And so, really being aware of of what the capacity is, and 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 providing better um, uh, staffing ratios is really imperative. Having higher educational standards and, and really increasing nursing staff in nursing homes, better pay for caregivers, paid sick leave, and different payment models. So there's a lot of opportunity moving forward. And with that, I think we're a little bit over time, so I'm going to turn it over. So thank you very much, Sarah and Patty, for that very sobering report from the front lines. So now we'll turn it over to uh, Carly Snyder and Tony Miss Williams at the House of Hope Alzheimer's Care Facility here in Nebraska. Carly and Tony. Hey everybody, this is Carly. I am the community nurse, aka director of nursing of our memory care here in Omaha, um, House of Hope Alzheimer's Care. And I am Tony Miss Williams. I'm the I'm the administrator um, of Royal Oaks and House of Hope Alzheimer's Care. So a little bit about us, um, we are an assisted living with memory care, so located here in Omaha, Nebraska. So we're going to talk more about our memory care as that's where we had our COVID positive residents. So in our memory care, we have a total of 42 apartments that are split amongst four neighborhoods. Um, each neighborhood houses either 10 or 11 residents. Um, we provide on-site daycare. We also provide um, a director of nursing for both sides of our building. We also have a medical director that comes in on a weekly basis, and we also utilize pharmacy and uh, physician's lab, uh, home health services, and podiatry as well. Kind of a little bit about our staffing is I'm the nurse manager, so I'm usually there during the day and I'm on call 24-7. Um, we have two medication aids um, on our first and our second shift um, that are split. So one med aid for two neighborhoods and then one med aid for the other two neighborhoods. And then we have four CNAs. So our ratios are six to one to give you a little bit of an idea. In preparing, we've talking a little bit about preparing for COVID. Uh, we communicated a lot with our staff, kind of letting them know what we knew about COVID, which is changing every single day. Um, one of the biggest things we made sure to do was keep our communication lines open, and we also created a dialogue through an app, through the WhatsApp, to kind of provide them with the most recent updates, and also we have a 
COVID-19 hotline. Um, one of the things that we found that was really beneficial is we created a COVID-19 training manual, um, as you can see up there. Talked about things as far as hand hygiene, proper donning and doffing of all types of PPE, cleaning and sanitizing, and even doing how to engage one-on-one -on -one activities with residents. Because at this point, um, you know, we knew that residents were going to be in their apartments, um, especially if we had any COVID in our building, and we were already doing that early on. Um, we also found, as I'm sure Washington did and all the other states in the United States, that it was really hard to come by PPE and, and products. So that was one of the things that we did in preparing was trying to order ahead of time um, from masks to gloves to hand sanitizer. And lucky enough, we were even donated some 3D printed masks from a local company here in Omaha, which was very beneficial to us. So we were lucky with that. We also reached out to various friends, family, and community members to get activity supplies for our residents as well. So with us, luckily we have a sister company that is in uh, the long-term care world as well, and our CEO was very proactive. So we did a lot of changes early on in the beginning of March. Um, as far as we implemented daily screenings on staff, so before their shift they had to screen themselves. Um, temperature, we went through the loaded questions, do you have a cough, do you have any of the current symptoms at that time that we were watching for in the beginning. And we also implemented screening our residents twice a day. Um, we also restricted visitors, volunteers, and non-essential staff, such as our hairdresser, which was really hard hit by our residents because they love to get their hair done every week. Um, we also implemented and really strongly encouraged social distancing and mask wearing in all areas, including the staff break rooms, because we all know we want all of our staff to have a break, be off the floor. And so when you're off the floor, well, you want to take your mask off and you want to take your gloves off. Um, but we really tried to remind them it's okay to take break together, but make sure you have those masks on and make sure you're six feet apart, if at all possible. Um, Go ahead. Just to add, um, for our visitor restrictions, we actually implemented that. Um, it started March 7th. So we started very early on with um, restricting visitors from coming into our community, as well as um, starting the process of um, having our staff wear masks very early on in the process. So that helped us tremendously. And also in part of our preparation, um, we work towards looking at backups for all staff in the community, um, including replacements from our sister company from all different roles from nursing staff to laundry to dietary. We implemented a weekly meeting to prepare should COVID hit our building. So, you know, us as nurses or even our administrator who was willing to work in laundry, who was willing to, to cook and provide those dietary services who could back up on maintenance, uh, maintenance and et cetera. And one of the things that we found with our management staff is because obviously we're a key role, um, was we prepared a folder basically of our day-to-day -day job duties. So that way, should one of us become positive, somebody could step in and do that for us. So discovering, I know this is a question that everybody has for probably every community, how the heck did it get in your building with you doing everything you were doing? Um, we discovered that it was a staff member. Um, a staff member had been around a sick loved one, um, which prompted kind of a further investigation where we then found out the staff member was positive um, and that there was possible other staff and resident exposure, which led to our initial testing on April 7th. So we ended up having 10 residents that were positive and two staff that were positive with a potential of up to 42 residents that could have possibly been exposed, as well as up to 10 potential staff. And we looked at that of who was working with that time frame when that, that staff member was there. So again, we kind of want to touch a little bit on um, our planning processes that we kind of kept in place and maybe things that had possibly changed. So with this, our screening process originally was you kind of screened yourself, you answered the questions, and you documented on, on the paper. We have now incorporated to where we have an actual online, it's a smart sheet app, where it is recorded on an iPad. Every single person that steps in the building has to do their temps and has to answer all of the questions, which of course are now more questions as symptoms change with COVID-19. And so that is an easier way for us to track. As being a nurse on call, it's very nice to have this app because should somebody answer yes to this question, it triggers us to follow up with that staff member. 
Obviously, a staff member is instructed to call us should they answer yes to any of these questions, but that they might forget to do that or might not take that step. So we get an indication on our phone or our iPad that triggers us to further investigate that. Should they need to be pulled off the floor and should they need to be tested? One of the things that we found um, was helpful as well is we did work really close with ICAP um, to help just kind of verify processes and they collaborated with us. So in the beginning, I think on our slides you can see where we have a separate staff entrance and a staff exit. In the beginning, we had it where everybody was kind of entering and exiting in the same, same door. We found, well, that's probably not the best thing to do. So as you can see in our front parking lot, that's kind of our courtyard gate there, where the staff for that area that was positive, that's where they came in and they entered. And then they had a separate extra exit that was completely on the other neighborhood. So you kind of came in clean and you left dirty. Um, in working with ICAP too, um, we discovered that our donning and doffing areas might be different in the two different neighborhoods. Um, so we made sure that that was universal and everybody was aware of that. We also made sure in our positive areas because we maintained two neighborhoods that were negative and we had two neighborhoods that were positive. So instead of having everybody go to the time clock, we implemented this time error sheet that you can see there. That is their way of clocking in and clocking out so we didn't have staff going throughout the building. So I know there was the question regarding um, how did we isolate our residents? Um, honestly, it went a lot better than what we kind of expected, I think, especially working in memory care. Um, obviously, it was challenging to the residents of them understanding why can't I leave my room? Why am I eating in my room? Why can't my family come and visit? Why, why, why? Um, it was a lot of education. We kind of explained to them of the illness going on. This is what's going on. This is why your families can't be here um, and that. We actually did not move residents from any different area. They all actually stayed in their own private apartments. So we actually had negative residents in a positive area, which probably would have freaked some people out. But we found in memory care, them being in their own environment, staying in their apartments was beneficial to them. Um, we also had dedicated staff. So as far as CNAs and the med aid and then my, myself as the nurse, what I did is when I came in in the morning, I would check in with our negative areas, not enter, but I would check in with staff. If there was anything that was pertinent and that needed to be addressed, we would pull the nurse from the other side of the building to go and address that negative area. And then we had a medication and CNAs that were dedicated to the positive areas as well as the negatives. So the only person that crossed over was the med aid passing amongst those two neighborhoods and then myself as the nurse doing daily rounds and doing checks on the residents. And then we had our CNAs pretty much stay in their neighborhood halls there. One of the other things that we utilized because we did have positives and negatives in the same area is we used a colored sign system. Basically that listed and showed that you needed to wear the full PPE going in, taking care of this resident, you know that they're positive, do not differentiate from this, this is what you need to do. And then residents' doors that were negative, they had a different colored sign on their door. Um, one thing we also offered our staff is because obviously we wanted to prevent the spread going outside of our building, is we did offer a safe area um, for those staff members to change their clothes in the shower prior to exiting for their shift should they wish. So talking a little bit more about uh, possible exposure. Um, with those residents that were negative within those positive areas, we basically monitored for signs and symptoms on a daily basis. Um, and we basically kind of treated them as if they were positive, um, just so we were, were careful the whole time. One thing about our community was the initial symptoms were diarrhea and runny nose, which were kind of obviously outside of the symptoms of cough fever or anything along those lines. Um, which again, we wanted to make sure that we were staying on top of should we have any other positives. So kind of, I wanted to talk a little bit about our testing. So on April 7th is when we initially tested eight residents due to being showing symptoms, the diarrhea and the runny nose. And we received a positive result on the 8th, which then of course prompted us to test the adjoining neighborhoods on April 9th. Um, with the positives remaining in the two adjoining neighborhoods, we did prompt to do a facility-wide in memory care to do that testing, which we did perform on May 2nd. 
So we did test all 42 residents and all four of the neighborhoods. Um, on May 7th, we were lucky enough to have all negative residents except for one resident that was previously positive. So we waited a little while and retested and she became negative on May 19th. Um, meal times, just touching a little bit on that. Um, meal times actually weren't very difficult for us because our residents were already in their apartments and we were already serving their meals to them there. Um, one of the things we utilized in our positive areas um, and actually all over memory care was paper products. That way it was easily disposed of and we didn't have to worry so much about the sanitizing options. Our dietary prepared all the food and delivered it to one of our entrances. So nobody from maintenance, dietary, management or any other nursing departments had to cross over into memory care where our positive residents were. So one thing that we did is we found it beneficial to go ahead and serve all of the residents that were able to help themselves and then ones that needed more cues and reminders or actually physically need to be fed, we did them last so we can be in there and spend that time with them. So things that worked for us. One thing that I can say is huge and that pops out in my mind is obviously the leadership and our teamwork and support. There's definitely, we could not have done it without a team. One of the biggest things I can say is that as the nurse, being on the floor and being present and being a leader, talking to them, listening to them, showing them what to do, properly putting on your gloves, properly putting on your mask. You know, your N95 doesn't look sealed. Let's make sure it's sealed. We want to protect you. We want to protect our residents and we want to protect everybody else. Keeping that open communication, being open and honest and listening and being forthright um, I, I developed a communication system, not only verbally and, you know, talking to everybody, but I had a daily update on positive, negatives, and symptomatic individuals. Um, we also had a very strong support system, not only from our current coworkers and teammates, but families, friends, anybody that we work with in the community, community were very, a good, strong support system for us. The other thing that I found as a leader and a manager is that we had to be open to ideas. Um, very many staff members came up with different ideas of ways to do things and being open was amazing. Um, and one thing that we also, is we continue to teach and continue to learn and being an example. Our building layout, I also feel is very beneficial. I know it's kind of hard to kind of see what our layout is like, but the nice thing of having either 10 or 11 apartments in each neighborhood and how they're separated out is very, very beneficial to us. It allotted us to have different entrances and exits so we weren't crossing positives with negatives and things like that at all costs. Um, again, all of our apartments are private. We did not have anybody, no husbands and wives or anything like that. So everybody had their own individual apartment and individual bathrooms. Um, we did not provide any whirlpools because right now we don't have any residents that like whirlpools and we didn't at that time. So luckily they all like to utilize their showers. Um, again, I just wanted to touch on the dedicated staff. So not only did we have dedicated staff in our positive areas, but we also had dedicated staff in our negative areas as well. Um, and basically our staff were nursing, dietary, maintenance. I had to fix things that I never thought I would be fixing <laughs> in my life. Um, but again, we all took on roles that maybe we wouldn't have done um, previously, but to help our residents and help our community through this. And then again, our infection control practices. Our direct care staff, we did not have housekeeping coming over. It was all our direct care staff. I'm talking your CNAs, your med aides, and myself as the nurse. We cleaned and we sanitized multiple times a shift from the cell phone to telephones, computer screens, to the tables, counters, high touch areas, anything you can imagine we touched. We even found turning around furniture to make the area less inviting for our memory care residents was very beneficial because originally we had all of our furniture turned around and that might seem like a very small thing to people, but when we turned it around and made it less inviting, our residents were less likely to come out and want to sit out and hang out. Um, we also tried to individualize the snacks and treats that were not only for our staff, but our residents as well. And we luckily had washable gowns um, where we utilized those in our positive areas and after you were there with the resident, it went into the washer and it got washed. So we were able to cut down on some PPE burn with that. Um, three things that would have been good to have in place, a little bit more advanced staff preparation. Um, and what I mean by that is having a concrete built schedule of who can fill in for who, who can do whose job. Um, training, again, I feel like we had some training prior to our COVID outbreak 
But I think, again, I think training needs to start from the date of hire and your point of orientation. Um, and again, supplies and dedicated equipment would have been nice. Here's a picture of our scale. We have one scale for our memory care, so it was hard to obtain weights on our negative residents, uh, sorry, on our positive residents, because we were so worried about cross-contaminating that having the dedicated scale and vitals equipment would have been great, as long as, and in addition, the additional PPE and, and cleaning supplies. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ted. Okay, well, thank you so much, uh, Carly and Tani. So uh, just to reiterate a uh, little bit of information uh, about NETEC. So again, we are the national, we started out as the National Ebola Training and Education Center, and we're now the National Emerging Pathogens Training and Education Center. Um, as I said earlier, we're here uh, to help you. Uh, we're also here to answer your questions. And so uh, questions about today's uh, webinar can be uh, posted to the Q&A button on this uh, website, but uh, questions that you may have in the future uh, can be sent to us at info at .org. And you can also request uh, technical assistance uh, there. So with that said, I think we do have time uh, for some uh, questions and answers. And uh, what I'll do is I'll read these and I'll allow any of our four experts to uh, chime in with an answer. So the first question, um, we have is what are your thoughts going forward in managing residents in situ versus transferring them uh, if you cannot provide single rooms for exposed residents? Anyone care to take a stab at that? This is Patty. I'll take a crack at it and then I'll um, open it up to see if my colleagues in King County would agree with what I say. Um, so I think this isn't ideal. Um, if you can't provide a single room for an exposed, for exposed residents, um, maybe by cohorting people with similar exposures and pulling the curtain between the rooms and um, put, pulling the curtain between the beds and, um, you know, keeping them on droplet precautions. What do you think, James? Uh, thanks, Patty. This is James. And uh, I just want to say thanks to Sarah for the nice introduction for me and Claire earlier. We were co-leading a lot of the long-term care work in the beginning, and uh, uh, it was a lot. But we, and we couldn't have done any of it without all of the rest of the team, many of whom you can see uh, as authors on that paper. So um, thanks for having us today. I would agree with what you said. I would add that, you know, I. Uh, in, the, in the outbreak in that paper that you discussed initially, they didn't move people around uh, as far, you know, for cohorting. And that was through a lot of discussions with CDC who were here helping us as well. And there was concern that moving folks around could create more exposures, especially since so many people were testing positive and we really didn't have a good handle on the situation. But eventually they did uh, move people around. And I think it needs to uh, be a discussion on each individual facility level about whether, you know, what what their capacity is and, and if they can create or if they already have protocols in place to safely move folks around without increasing potential exposures through the movement process. Um, but overall, I would agree, I think we wanna try and cohort people if at all possible. The other thing we've done here in Washington with uh, DSHS, our regulatory agency has started contracting or trying to contract with facilities to have dedicated COVID units. And so when they identify facilities, and this has come up quite a bit, especially in adult family homes that really can't isolate patients effectively or residents effectively in their facility, that they um, help uh, coordinate transfers to a, a facility that does have one of those COVID positive units. Uh, we need a lot more of those for that to be effective in a situation where like we had back in March. So if, if we start seeing a lot more outbreaks, which we are seeing now repeat outbreaks in a lot of facilities, we'll need a lot more of those moving forward. But thanks, James. So we'll move on to the next question. Very straightforward question. I'm not sure there's a straightforward answer, uh, but do you mask residents? Yes, we do in memory care as much as we can. It's frequent reminders and also in our traditional assisted living, every single one of our residents has multiple masks available to them and they are reminded on a regular basis. So are there situations uh, where you deviate from that policy? We really try not to. It is 
constant reminders and signs everywhere. We will remind them to go back to their room and staff will physically go and help them put their mask on. And we also like them to wear their mask anytime staff enters into their apartment. Okay, well, thank you. So next question, what are some of the cohorting guidelines that you may have implemented at the long-term care facility? So in uh, Washington, we recommend that um, we test residents that if you ha are suspicious that a resident may be COVID positive, that they're tested um, and they're on droplet and contact precautions while we're waiting for their results to come back. And when their result is positive, um, then we would move them to the COVID positive unit. Then that would be, we wouldn't move them before uh, the result came back. Um, and then we could cohort those folks with other COVID positive residents on, you know, hopefully a unit or a section of the building that's dedicated and, and um, independent from um, the rest of the building. And then the other um, situation uh, that we have here, and probably you guys have it too, obviously, is that when people are coming in and need to be isolated or they need to be quarantined, not isolated for 14 days while um, um, being under observation to see if they do develop symptoms, then they would be in a private room. Um, it kind of is helpful if you can put people on the same level of precautions in the same sort of location. It makes it a little easier for staff to um, comply with the guidance. And then, um, then there are, uh, you know, spaces for folks who have never tested positive. So, um, and I'll, I'll leave that there. Okay, thanks very much. So the next question I think is a philosophical one of sorts. So if this was your family member uh, in one of these facilities, would you recommend they stay there? Well, if my family member was at House of Hope Alzheimer's Care Center, I would recommend that they stay there. They seem like they're doing a really, really good job. Um, I think that's a complex question. So if so it would depend, right? So if my, my family member was there for rehab and I had the capacity to be able to take them home and that and provide the level of care um, needed for them, I think um, I would consider that. If I could quarantine them in my home without putting other folks at risk, maybe I would consider that. But um, I think this is a hard question. I don't think a lot of folks who are in our long-term care settings have um, you know that there are a lot of options um, and it may be better um, that folks stay in the buildings where uh, people have recognized that there are outbreaks rather than moving to a building that doesn't seem to have anything going on you know because we don't know right that's so i think that's a hard question also hope anything to add i would agree with that Okay, well, thank you very much. I think that's probably all the questions we have time for today. If we didn't get to your question, rest assured, we'll try to answer it and post the answer to the website. So we very much appreciate you participating in today's webinar. Uh, you can access schedule through our website at NETEC.org, and you can email us with questions at info at NETEC.org. So again, thank you very much for participating in today's webinars, and we will see you next week. This is Tetsi Slack saying goodbye.